in the home stretch of uh, this segment of sessions. And I want to uh, do just a quick little exercise here to help us visualize what's in Philippians. So if you have your Bible, please turn to Philippians. And uh, you can go back in the lecture to the chart that uh, has the word counts on it. Um, it's in the handout back of about number 20, uh, t number 20, where we were a while ago. I've got uh, word frequencies. Word frequencies. And it looks like It looks like that. So in Philippians, we see that the word used most is Christ, uh, next God, next Jesus, next Lord. Then a verb that is translated, I think. But um, I just did a, a quick search here. And that word, think, it's, it's not just a sort of rational thinking. Notice how it's translated. Um, it occurs ten times in the Greek New Testament. That's over here, and each time it occurs is in red. And then uh, I'll kind of show you over here on the right side where that word for thinking gets translated. In 1.7, it's right for me to feel this way. To, to have this regard. So it's, it's to think in the sense of having a certain disposition or mindset about something. 2-2. Uh, two, two. Uh, make my joy complete by literally thinking the same way or thinking the same thing. They translate it in the NIV by being like-minded. So that's that verb for thinking. But, but to have a certain disposition. So it's not you know, an objective thinking about something. It's a, 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 an up-close regard. And then now uh, in Philippians 2.5, a famous verse. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset. Literally in Greek, this is a command. Think this among yourselves, which also in Christ Jesus. And there are a couple different ways of translating that, and I won't get into that. But you can see that this is a word for thinking, again, that has to do with a deep disposition, how you are oriented. And I'll do one more, Philippians 3.15. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. Therefore, as many as are, you could also translate that, perfect or mature, uh, let us think this, or let us think in this way. And if another one thinks something different, then God will reveal that to the person. So, our, the fundam, our fundamental outlook, that's what's being talked about here. There's a lot in Ephesians about people's fundamental orientation. It's not an armchair thinking. You know, it's, it's how you are bent. And sometimes our bent is off and it needs to be reoriented and the gospel does that. 
Paul uses the word brother nine times, and uh, as I note, seven times it's plural and it's vocative, which means it's direct address. And so seven of those times he's saying to the, the Philippians, brothers and sisters. The word brother in the plural is inclusive, and it's male and female. So Philippians has this nurturing tone because as you read it, Paul keeps saying brothers and sisters. He's appealing to them in a pastoral way. Gospel is mentioned nine times. The verb rejoice occurs nine times, which is one of the ways he gets the reputation for being the gospel or the, uh, the epistle of joy, especially since there are verses like rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And then the noun joy occurs five times. So if you add nine and five, then uh, joy or rejoicing is right up there almost next to kurios, Lord, for frequency of mention in the book. Paul wrote Philippians, and now I'm back on the lecture, which was scheduled for 10 o'clock today. Paul wrote this letter to thank a church that he founded. And I have to appeal to your reading of Acts 16 to remind you of how that church was founded. He was in jail, and they sent him money. And we read about that at the end of Philippians. Their love brought Paul practical relief and joy. And that's one reason rejoicing is prominent there. A second primary theme is Christ and his glory. Christ is the very essence of life for the believer. And Paul says in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ, which is pretty good. And to die is gain. That's a primary theme. He's the justification for the suffering to which Christians are called. Notice what he says in verse 129. It has been granted to you, like God's doing you a favor here, you're being graced with something, for the sake of Christ, that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict, that word in Greek is agon, uh, it, it's a word we get agony from. It means struggle. The Arabic word is jihad, which in Arabic can mean holy war, but the word jihad in Arabic also has a, uh, a spiritual meaning that in Islam you need to struggle to obey God. And that struggle, jihad is the word, is like the word agon here, experiencing the same conflict, the same tension that you saw I had, maybe referring to his imprisonment, or it may refer to when he founded the church at Philippi, what happened to him? He got arrested, he and Silas, and he got beaten, and he got put in jail. They saw the cost of discipleship when Paul planted the church. And so he says, you've been granted the same agon that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. I'm back in jail. <laughs> Christ is the justification for the suffering to which Christians are called. For his sake. It's been granted to you for his sake. Suffering for a child of God is never meaningless. It's always for his sake. Christ models and makes possible the mindset of humility, selflessness, and love for the Father to which the gospel message beckons God's people. Probably the most famous passage in Philippians 
begins in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, talking about his preexistence, before he was incarnate, he was one with the Father. This is a mystery. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And, you know, scholars dispute what that means. And I think the basic idea is he was willing to lay hold of the glory that he had with the Father in heaven and to come and to take on the likeness of man. He did not count equality with God a thing to be hung on to, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. Okay, now what is he going to do? He's the second person of the Trinity, and he has taken on flesh. Here's what he did. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. Now, there's a lot compressed there, and he doesn't have to explain it all because he founded the church there. But what is... Um, as Charles Wesley said, what is mystery all? Tis mystery all. The immortal dies. Who can explain his strange design? How could a sinless being die for sin? How could it be that he made him who knew no sin to be sin? on our behalf, so that we could become the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5.20. How could that be? Well, Paul doesn't draw that out here, but that's, that's behind his thinking when he says he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That was the just for the unjust. And it's in fulfillment of the scriptures, Psalm 22. Why have you forsaken me? And many other Old Testament passages that foretell the death and the resurrection of the Messiah. Therefore, since Christ did what he did, for the reason that he did it, God has highly exalted him. You know, he raised him from the dead and he put him in his right hand. And he's bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verses right out of Isaiah. Um, in a way, if we remember this from Philippians, we've got 60% of the book. <laughs> the incarnation, the humiliation, the exaltation of the Messiah. And just for the record, you know, no pressure on you. You can think whatever you want about the name that's above every name. But as I interpret this, it's not Jesus. It's God's own name, however you want to say what we call the sacred tetra tetragrammaton, the four letters in Hebrew that we normally now translate Yahweh or Yahweh the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush, this is my name. And it was not pronounced for so many centuries that, uh, you know, scholars debate how the Jews would have said it. But, you know, we, we say it Yahweh. Now, uh, if you say Jesus, since Jesus is one with Yahweh, you're not going far wrong. But I think that Paul's point here is that in exalting the Son to his right hand and restoring him to the heavenly fellowship that he had before the incarnation, that once again we see that Jesus is the kurios, Jesus is one with Yahweh. He is God. Now, it's Jesus that's God. So again, it, you know, we don't have to say it's either Jesus or it's 
Yahweh, but when you, when you interpret this, you, do, you, know, you have to ask, what he says, he gave him the name that's above every, every other name. Uh, Yahushua was about as uh, rare a name as uh, John or Ben or Jason. There were hundreds of Jesuses in the first century. And there are a lot of them that were crucified. Because the Romans crucified Jewish men by the hundreds. And Jesus was one of the most common names. So this Jesus is special because God gave him the name that's above every name. He, he shared his own name with him. And the name of God the Father is not Jesus. The name of God the Father to the best of our ability to know, is the name he gave himself at the burning bush. Or at least we could argue that. Now, God has many names. He's called over a hundred things in the Bible. So we don't have to quibble too much about that. But uh, I want to uh, underscore the exaltation of the, of, of the Christ. And, you know, how can flesh be integrated with divinity? Uh, we see it in Jesus God was human, but not just a man. Christ was human, but not just a man. He was divinity taking on human form. And I've pretty much gone through that paragraph. Other theological emphases in Philippians include God's faithfulness. This is one of the dearest verses in Philippians. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at or in the day of Christ Jesus, 1.6. Cling to that hope. <laughs> he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Of course, Paul said that to the Thessalonians too. Um, he who promised, he, he who, uh, something like prom gave you a promise will, will, will keep it. What, God finishes what he starts. But God grants salvation, God shows mercy, God imputes Christ's righteousness, God bestows peace. God is a big factor in Philippians. The fellowship of Christ's sufferings, I talked about this last night. Paul draws, Paul models a faith that not only draws on Christ's resurrection strength, but also yearns for communion with him in service and when necessary suffering. That's 310. And the importance of the whole church. Every saint in Christ Jesus is who Paul writes to. He's in jail and he drew a lot of strength from the Philippian congregation. Timothy and Epaphroditus were indispensable ministry parties. Uh, partners, Euodia and Syntyche, labored side by side with Paul in the gospel, together with Clement. And then there are others whose names are in the book of life. Even for an apostle, discipleship is not a lone eagle matter. And as the Philippians met Paul's needs, he knew that God would resource his faithful church. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul said that in prison. That's a few verses after 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Be very careful about taking these verses out of context and setting yourself up for horrible disappointment. Uh, Paul was in prison. Could he have gotten up and walked walk out of prison? He said, I can do all things. Uh, that's not what he intended to convey. In fact, if you read it in context, his point is, I've learned to thrive with plenty and with nothing. And it, it's really the lesson of 2 Corinthians 12. God's grace is sufficient for Paul. And when you read Philippians 4, he's, he's kind of warning the Philippians. I'm very glad you sent me the money, but you know something? I could have done without it. You know, don't let it go to your head that I'm thanking you for this. Uh, whatever God sends my way, I have learned 
that with Christ, I can hack it. So I'm actually more thrilled for your sake. If you read Philippians 4, 10 through 20 carefully, he says, I'm more thrilled for what this says about you and your relationship to God than I am for how it alleviates my suffering. Because I can live with suffering, and I'm glad I got your money, but I'm even gladder for what this says about your responsiveness to God. Which is, uh, all, it's not quite a slap in the face, but it's kind of a slap on the hand. Because as he writes this letter, he knows there's some dissent there. And Euodia and Syntyche, he praises them, but they're at each other's throats. And so he tells them, I want you to get along. So he knows there's some trouble in the camp. And he doesn't want them to uh, think that they've kind of like bribed their way into uh, a rebuke-free letter. This letter contains a little bit of rebuke. And it's in that context. If you've got that coffee cup verse or that t-shirt verse, don't throw it away. But don't let it screw you up. You cannot do all things. And you don't want to do all things. You want to do the one thing. You want to do the thing that God wants you to do. And you can do anything that God puts you into through Christ who strengthens you. But you can't just, as a Christian, put your finger on a goal and say, I can do that. That's, uh, that's secular delusion. You know, that's, that's what high school guidance counselors tell kids. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a measure of truth. You know, you set your mind to something and you work and you sacrifice and, and you might get there. But even at that level, it's not always true. And there's a lot of disappointment that comes from kids being told they can do anything and actually they can't do everything. You know, you maybe want to be, be a fighter pilot, you find out you're colorblind. Sorry. Or you may want to be an engineer, and you find out you're a poet. You're not wired to do engineering. And Christians aren't wired to do anything they want. They are called to the obedience of faith. But now, in that sphere, we can do anything through Christ who strengthens us. Including... Enjoy the benefits of the food that God provides for us. So let's uh, take a break and do that. And I'll see you back here about 20 till 1. So you've got an hour and five minutes. Thank you. <laughs>